Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Randy Morganson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then I'll offer my analysis. Randy Morganson was born on May 21, 1942, and grew up in California's Yosemite Valley. As a child, he spent a lot of time outdoors. He was physically active and adventurous. Randy had a dream of being a world-class mountaineer and wanted to explore exotic lands. In 1958, when Randy was 16, he took a job fixing bicycles from $1.35 an hour at a resort located in Yosemite National Park. In June 1960, he found work at the only gas station in the park. He would fix vehicles and give directions and advice to park visitors. In June 1961, Randy graduated from high school. He was ranked number 15 out of 45 graduates. He was accepted into a college in Flagstaff, Arizona, where he majored in recreation land management. A year and a half into his education, he took the spring semester off and worked for the National Park Service. The title of his position was Ungraded Laborer. This wasn't the type of future for Randy that his parents were excited about. They repeatedly encouraged him to abandon the realm of the ungraded and return to his studies. In the fall of 1963, Randy went back to college in Arizona. He had a strong interest in philosophy. His parents were pleased with his decision, but they wouldn't be pleased for long. In the fall of 1964, Randy decided that college was not the best choice for him, and he dropped out. He was now interested in a career in photography. On February 8, 1965, Randy went in a different direction and applied for a seasonal backcountry park ranger position with the National Park Service. He was offered a position two months later in the Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. Randy reported for duty on May 1. The position was only for the summer. Randy was in danger of being drafted by the military and being sent to fight in the Vietnam War. He avoided this by temporarily returning to college in Arizona. Not long after this, Randy left college and joined the Peace Corps. He ended up traveling to the Himalayas, where he spent a lot of time climbing mountains. He returned to the United States three and a half years later at the age of 28. Eventually, he found work as a Yosemite ranger in the winter and returned to his summer ranger job in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. After getting a bad performance review at his winter job, he decided to stick with just the summer position. In 1971, Randy met a woman named Judy Douglas. She was an artist. They eventually married. She would sometimes accompany Randy on his adventures in the wilderness. In 1980, Randy and Judy purchased a 700-square-foot house in Susanville, California. Over the next several years, Randy had a productive career as a seasonal park ranger. His efforts saved lives. He was considered an extremely experienced and conscientious ranger. His job involved a lot of different functions. Some of them were exciting and glamorous, and others not as much. For example, he was a law enforcement officer and a medic, but he was also a trash collector and would issue citations for various offenses like having a large campfire. Randy liked the adventurous and higher status elements of the job, but he wasn't a big fan of the menial labor. He came to despise the park visitors. Randy became pretty close with other rangers, maybe a little too close. Sometime in the 1990s, he started having an affair with another ranger. His wife Judy found out about the affair and asked for a divorce. When Randy reported for the 1996 summer season at the National Park, divorce was on his mind. He told people the divorce papers represented the heaviest thing in his bag. Randy's colleagues noticed that he was somber and had low mood. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. Randy's job was to patrol an 80-square-mile region around Bench Lake. There was a ranger camp at Bench Lake. It was a 12-by-15 tent on top of a plywood platform. 
The elevation there was 10,800 feet. 54-year-old Randy Morganson last made contact with his colleagues on Saturday, July 20, 1996. The next day, July 21, Randy prepared to start another patrol. He was going to be away from the ranger station for three to four days. Randy locked up many of his belongings in a steel footlocker, including his park-issued Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum revolver. Randy was supposed to carry it with him at all times, but he did not think he would ever be able to use it on a person. By his logic, it wasn't worth carrying the extra weight. Randy packed up a number of items for his patrol, including a new Motorola HT-1000 radio. He probably had enough supplies with him for about five days, a little more than he needed because he wanted to be prepared in case something went wrong. Randy left a note at the ranger station indicating a few things. He was on patrol, his radio was with him and not in the tent, and he asked people not to disturb his camp. Randy incorrectly indicated the date as June 21 instead of July 21, probably just a simple mistake with no significance. After taping the note to his tent, Randy started his patrol by hiking into the wilderness. Two days later, on July 23, Randy's supervisor noticed that he failed to check in by radio for the third day in a row. This was not unheard of because the radios didn't always work well in the terrain. In addition to the potential radio problems, Randy was a highly experienced ranger. Therefore, the supervisor was not concerned initially. Despite this, another ranger was sent to check up on Randy. When the ranger arrived at the Bench Lake camp, he found the note that Randy left, but Randy was not at the camp. Now there was even more of a concern about Randy's safety. His supervisor assembled a group of rangers at the Bench Lake camp. They came up with a few possibilities about what happened to Randy. There were concerns that he may have left the patrol zone. A special investigator was assigned to look at that possibility as the rangers started searching the patrol area. Eventually, the search team grew to about 100 people, including eight dog teams. On August 1, 1996, after no success, the full-scale search was terminated. Randy Morganson was presumed dead. On July 14, 2001, which was about five years after Randy disappeared, this theory would be confirmed. A maintenance crew was operating off-trail at a place called Window Peak. They found a backpack as well as a boot containing bones. Rangers were called in. They found Randy's radio. The knob was in the on position. They also found his shirt. Randy's badge and name tag were still attached. The rangers concluded that Randy was walking alone on an ice bridge when it failed. He fell into a fast-moving creek and drowned. They believe this happened on July 22 or July 23, 1996 so one or two days after he departed Bench Lake. Not all the rangers agreed about what happened. It seemed to be very unusual that Randy would die in the way that he did, considering his level of experience. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. The seasonal backcountry ranger position was a difficult and thankless job. It was not really a great long-term place to work, not a job that somebody could build into a career. There were some permanent positions with the National Park Service, but they were hard to get, and almost all the administrators had a college degree. There was no job security with the seasonal position. The rangers had to reapply each year if they wanted any chance of getting their job back. The position did not have medical benefits or a pension plan. Rangers had to pay for their own law enforcement training and their own medical technician training. After working each season, they only accumulated a very small amount of money. The rangers would joke that they were being paid in sunsets. The seasonal rangers were never awarded any medals for their performance. Those were only available to permanent employees. They felt as though they were second-class workers, not appreciated by anyone, not their supervisors, and not the public. The only benefit the job had was a death benefit. A ranger could designate a beneficiary who would receive $100,000 if they died in the performance of their duty. So the one benefit the job did possess was something the ranger could not even enjoy. About half of the rangers in that seasonal position were young people 
who wanted to do something adventurous before college or while taking a break from college. This was a way to have fun before getting a traditional full-time job. The other half of the rangers were a lot like Randy. They kept reapplying for the job year after year, knowing that there wasn't any future there. Some felt as though they were addicted to the outdoors. I thought of a few slogans that the National Park Service could use to recruit people into this awful job. I will list them at the end of the video. Item number two. At the time of his death, Randy had been depressed for quite some time. In 1993, three years before he died, his father and his mother both passed away. One of his co-workers said that Randy was having something like a midlife crisis. Randy had lost interest in his job and in other activities. He had an affair, and divorce was weighing heavy on his mind. The special investigator who was looking into Randy's disappearance contacted Judy. She informed him that she only heard from Randy one time after he left for the summer season. He called and asked her if he could come home and they could work things out. She advised him that it was too late. Essentially, she told him to take a hike, which ironically, he was already doing. It sounds like Randy regretted his decision to have an affair. Randy seemed particularly philosophical, depressed, and melancholy when he showed up for the summer season. A co-worker told him about the flowers. Randy replied, I don't find much pleasure in flowers anymore. Randy told another co-worker that he wondered if it had been worth it being a ranger for all these years. About three weeks before he disappeared, Randy traveled to another camp to get a replacement radio after his failed. When he was there, he talked about philosophical topics and questioned his life choices. He was in possession of a book about a guy who reacted to marital challenges by taking a road trip across the country. On July 20, 1996, the night before Randy departed on his fateful patrol, he had a conversation with two other rangers over the radio. Randy ended the conversation by saying, I won't be bothering you two anymore. This could have meant nothing, like he was simply not going to communicate further that evening, or it could have meant something entirely different. Item number three, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. There are two major theories about this case. One, Randy died due to an accident, and two, he died on purpose or while being reckless, like it's what he wanted or he didn't care what happened to him. There's a high level of disagreement among the rangers who knew Randy. The conclusions that each of them drew are highly dependent on how they weighed the various factors. Some people believe Randy's depression explains his behavior. They say that he never would have walked across an unsafe ice bridge. Others note that these types of accidents occur all the time in the wilderness. Randy had his fair share of injuries on the job. He was not immune to making a mistake. In my opinion, Randy probably died by accident. Perhaps his state of mind contributed to the accident, like he was reckless due to being despondent and depressed, but I don't think he left the ranger station with no intent to return. It seems strange that he would have left a note saying he would be back in three to four days if he knew he would never be coming back. The fact that his radio was in the on position means that he was trying to call for help or he just happened to be on the radio when he was crossing the ice bridge. I think it's more likely that he turned the radio on to seek assistance. Item number four, what were Randy's personality characteristics? Randy appeared to be high in openness to experience. He was philosophical, intellectually curious, and demonstrated abstract thinking. He had mid-range conscientiousness, low extroversion. He was analytical and kept to himself, low to mid-range agreeableness, and low to mid-range neuroticism. Item number five, how did Randy end up in such a bad place toward the end of his life? Again, this is just a theory, my opinion. Randy wanted to spend his life outdoors. He loved hiking and mountain climbing. He did not want a traditional job, but at the same time, he resented the fact that he was never promoted to a permanent position or a supervisory position. Randy lived between two worlds, what he desired and what was realistic. When he initially accepted the seasonal job, it was like a dream come true. But after reapplying for the same job for over 20 years, Randy started to feel like he threw his life away. 
He didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have a pension, job security, or benefits. He was getting divorced, and he was tired of dealing with the park visitors. He believed that the hikers acted as if they were better than him. He particularly resented having to pick up their trash. Everything in Randy's life reminded him that he was in a low-level job. Sometimes people develop a nostalgia for their first job or one of their early jobs, and they try to go back to that position, like working in a fast food restaurant, at an amusement park, or something like that. They soon realize that some jobs are more appropriate for early stages of one's career. The jobs that are fun do not always pay the bills. I think this is what happened to Randy. He kept a job better suited for someone just trying to have some fun, as if it could become a viable career. Now moving to my final thoughts. Despite Randy's unfortunate end and the struggles he faced with his career, he led an amazing life. In addition to fulfilling his dream of spending time outdoors, Randy saved several lives as a park ranger and advocated for the protection of the wilderness. He may not have liked the people who visited the park, but some of this was because he valued nature so much. He felt as though people were trying to destroy the wilderness. He viewed himself as a defender of the wild. In his final moments, Randy offered one more lesson. Nature can be dangerous, so it is critical to give it respect. If the wilderness could kill someone as experienced as Randy, no one is immune from its power. As I mentioned, I thought of a few slogans the National Park Service could use for the seasonal ranger job. Here's what I came up with. One, blaze a new trail to financial destruction. Two, enjoy nature's bounty because it's the only one you'll be getting. Three, take the scenic route to your career success. And four, join the Park Service. It's all downhill from here. Those are my thoughts on the case of Randy Morganson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.